Hey everybody, it's Chainsaw Reacts. What you guys are about to witness is my third interview with Joshua Fine, who of course worked on Wolverine and the X-Men, Avengers, Earth's Minus Heroes, and he actually did some work on the spectacular Spider-Man. We cover a lot of topics, including those shows, and also a show that he was working on for a bit that got incorporated kind of into Avengers, Earth's Minus Heroes, which is a show called Hulk Gamma Core that didn't get past a certain point in the production phase in terms of them, him working on the show, along with others. And it was really cool to talk to him. We cover a lot of topics, and I hope you guys will enjoy this hour-long discussion with him it was really great to talk to him again and at some point we're going to set up a live interview or a live discussion with you guys at some point so you guys can ask questions and all that kind of stuff it's going to be great so anyways here's my interview with joshua fine hope you guys enjoyed it because it's pretty pretty cool so first of all third time third time speaking with you josh uh i wanted to jump in first before we get into anything else because the last time we spoke it was the day before disney plus day and we had talked about X-Men, the animated series from the 90s, and about it was going to come back or not. And you're like, well, we haven't heard nothing. The day after the news dropped X-Men 97, uh, what what was your thoughts when you heard about that? I mean, that's it's pretty crazy to bring in that show back. Yeah, it was kind of kind of insane. You looked very prescient after that conversation. It looked like you knew it was coming, and I was clueless. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't, know. Yeah, I, I mean... I never would have guessed that a show from 30 years ago that I watched as a kid would get revived. Like that's not something that you really ever think is possible, but we live in interesting times with these streaming platforms and uh, sort of the cycle of nostalgia leading to things getting unearthed that you thought were lost and gone forever. Um, it's a good way to I think it's it. great. I think it's, there's like no question that the 90s X-Men series is probably the single most influential mm. piece of animation or piece of TV, really, that Marvel has ever done. Uh, it had a huge impact on me uh, growing up. It led to my entire love of superheroes. Um, full stop, really. Like it was yeah. the show that led to my love of comic books and superheroes. Um, and I know it had similar impact to a lot of the people that still work there at Marvel. So, I mean, and, and I remember when I was little, I would come home after school and watch on my VHS tape back in the day, the VHS of the Jerkonaut episode, just over and over and over. I don't know why I was just so in, enthralled with that. And the fact they're bringing back the cast, like most of them, obviously, yeah, it's pretty insane to see the original voice actor for Wolverine in studio recording lines, like it's just bizarre. Um, and I'm thinking, cause you, of course you worked on Wolverine and the X-Men worked on Avengers Earth's Minus Heroes. What were some of the things that you not like, you know, obviously, you know, got inspired by, but things that you carried over into Wolverine and the X-Men, like I, I, we have to do this, or maybe that was the collective idea. Like there was stuff that worked so well with that series. How can we incorporate something like that into this one? Yeah, I think, uh, there are a bunch of things, uh, just the, the tone, the serious storytelling, um, oh, yeah. the sense that you're you're telling stories that actually matter, that are allegories for things in the real world uh, that mm -hmm. people care about. Um, the serialization of it also, uh, I think, was pretty big. I mean, back back in the '90s when you were watching it live, if you missed a week, then there was no way to know what you had missed, and you just had to live with the fact that you messed up and you would probably never see that episode again. Yeah. Especially with how some episodes had multiple, multiple parts to them. Yeah. And they didn't really come out on VHS ever. They were almost impossible to find. Mm -hmm. um, I think I had night of the Sentinels, which was the pilot on VHS. Oh, yes. yes. I don't know that anything else was available for decades. There was no way to get your hands on those episodes and, mm. until like, uh, uh, well, streaming was really the first thing that made them widely available to people, I think. And, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure my VHS of Juggernaut was probably like bootlegged, just recorded off the, the box set or whatever. That's what my grandpa used to do all the time, like old Godzilla films. He would just record them. <laughs> um, like I, I remember specifically just being amazed by the Night of the Sentinels, that first episode, because it really brought you into the world. And like you said, the serialization of it where – you have to keep up with the show. Like you have mm -hmm. to like, and he, I remember too, when they put it on Disney plus, it was not in order at first, the X-Men episodes, like it was all over the place. People were like trying to figure out, okay, how do I watch it? Like it was impossible. Cause they had stuff everywhere and they had stuff missing. Uh, 
Now, in terms of the revival of it, like, obviously, we had discussed Wolverine and the X-Men and Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes. Like, you know, you just never know. And I feel like from like you see the nostalgia of it, I mean, that's what brought X-Men back, I think, is because of the mm-hmm. fact that people loved it. Uh, and I honestly think that your shows that you worked on deserve that love, too, and deserve to be brought back because, you know, there's a whole new platform for it. Because live TV, it's still a thing now, but, like, mostly everybody talks about streaming shows or yeah. shows that are on, available on streaming and, of course, the stuff you worked on. Um now I remember something back. I kept thinking about it. For some reason, when you mentioned that you you worked on a Hulk series, you were like developing it. Mm-hmm. Was that something like how far along did that get in terms of the process of like were you writing on scripts or were you just kind of trying to develop like what exactly can you can like what can you do and what can you not do? Because you know. So um, it was leading up to the release of the Incredible Hulk in theaters. Uh, we got greenlit to do a Hulk animated series as sort of a, not really a tie into it because it had nothing to do with the movie, um, the series that we were developing, but I guess sort of a loose association with the fact that Hulk was going to be out there and on everybody's minds again. And trying to capitalize Um, on it probably, right? yeah, Yeah, pretty much. Uh, the, the show was called Hulk Gamma Core. Um, we got pretty far. I mean, we had finished basic development on the show. We had designs for characters. We had a Bible done. Um, we had gotten as far as scripting the first two episodes. Um, okay. And, and then the plug got pulled. Uh, yeah. And was that, due to, <laughs> was that due to budget or timing it, or? To be honest, my understanding was Incredible Hulk didn't do as well in the box office as people thought mm, or people okay. at Marvel thought it was going to. And they just had no qualms about pulling the rug out from under us, even though we were developing something that had basically nothing to do with that movie at that point. But um, oh, the entire the entire reason for developing the series was to cash in on the movie. So, And, and um, that's, that's really unfortunate because I feel like that would have been pretty cool because – Hulk, of course, had his own animated series in the 90s, but it, they didn't do a lot of episodes comparatively to, like, Spider-Man or X-Men. So to do another Hulk show, like, not connected to the MCU, but just doing your own thing, but, like, hey, Hulk, everyone knows about Hulk. He's over here. Because they didn't. I don't think they, I've ever actually talked about what that show was about. It was weird and kind of out there, but it was a cool concept. Uh, it was basically we were borrowing elements of planet Hulk and other elements from older comics and doing sort of a pseudo team up story that wasn't quite the Avengers, but Mm. um, there were little tidbits that got rolled into earth's mightiest heroes. And um, sort of the foundation of the storyline was that shield was capturing villains and sending them through uh, a portal, sort of like the, the, um, negative zone portal in earth's mightiest heroes yeah. and basically dumping all of these gamma villains on an alien planet that they thought was a secure prison world. Wow. Um, but then it, it turned out that this was all part of the leader's machinations and the leader was developing like of course. this entire leader gamma civilization <laughs> on this planet. And so shield recruits the Hulk to go through the portal to straighten things out on the other side. And he takes Hawkeye and Black Panther with them and and yeah and oh it was God. <laughs> it was crazy. I mean it was it was Hulk with Hawkeye and Black Panther on an alien world fighting gamma villains and all kinds of like crazy leader technology and um it, it, it would make a great video game actually come to think of it. it was yeah cool. and so yeah that would be oh my gosh I cannot believe that that almost existed. That is crazy. Yeah. That is a crazy concept but the you tied it, of course, with the negative zone portal, that kind of idea of transporting villains off world. And then you brought in what I think is the most interesting part, because we had discussed about how Hulk and Hawkeye's dynamic in Avengers was so like interesting. And so you like you kind of brought that in, like, yeah, they're, you know, because I'm I'm assuming, I'm I i do not know, they probably would have had the same kind of banter, I'm guessing. <laughs> Cause I mean, Hawkeye's going to a planet, like an alien planet with 
this big green gamma guy. Like, how mm -hmm. are you supposed to respond to that? You know, that's really cool, man. Was there uh, was there other like plans for like abomination? Was he a part of the villains or was that? Yeah, something? we we were using every Hulk villain ever, pretty much. I think actually a lot of the uh, the Hulk villains that appear in the cube in in the episodes of Earth's Mightiest oh, Heroes, uh, yeah. when you see them. Mm -hmm. um, some of those were designed for Gamma Core and uh, by by Ciro, who did all of the basic character design work on the show. Um, and we just ported them over because we needed as many villains as we could get our hands on anyway for <laughs> the pilot of Earth's Mightiest Heroes. So that is crazy. That's I mean, that, that's really like useful. You were able to use those designs and able to kind of bring some of those concepts over. So like, it's not like you're completely getting rid of all these ideas. Like, you're just kind of modifying them because we have yeah. this whole new team. That's really cool. Like Zax and Bybeast Beast and Madman. Uh, I think all of those were at some point on the table what was uh she hulk involved i'm assuming she was involved or maybe there was like a because i know you said something about where daredevil was off limits for like yeah, daredevil was off limits uh we never talked about bringing she hulk in um uh, but you know we hadn't gotten super far into the story plotting for that show yet so gotcha man that's that's really unfortunate I'm, I'm I'm obviously thankful. I think people are going to really like hearing that. Like, what? There was a Hulk show called Gamma Core? Because we have a Hulk show, Agents of Smash or something. I, I haven't ever seen it, but um, yeah, I would love to see Gamma Core. That sounds awesome. Uh, I mean, and honestly, I think if you guys would have kept going with Avengers, you could have incorporated that, like a storyline like that in terms of, okay, well, the show didn't happen, so let's do it here with Avengers. Because, like, that'd be crazy, right? They go to an alien planet full of, like, Gamma... Uh, characters and they have to fight uh the leader again because i mean because you brought a similar thing with that with whole with the leader trying to take over that town and trying to take over the whole world it's kind of like that concept and i god i love the leader yeah <laughs> so i mean the gamut town episodes of uh of earth's mightiest heroes were a little bit mm -hmm. inspired by the work that i had done on Gamma Core. I mean, they were also drawing from, or Gamma World, I should say. They were also drawing from a storyline in the comic um, mm. called Gamma yeah. Town, uh, and and then there was plenty of original stuff too. Chris Chris pumped a lot of good ideas into those episodes. Oh, of course, oh, of course, he got to. Uh, I I got notified of a tweet that I know we had. To, I think we had discussed this briefly before. Of where Christopher openly admitted, and you know, I've, I, I think you said this before in a chat, maybe off recording or not, but where Spectacular Spider Man's Josh's Spider Man was going to be the Spider Man in Avengers, and then how they got scrapped. Um, was I'm assuming that was a studio like above you decision? I'm assuming, because yeah, it was, it was a decision that I pretty adamantly disagreed with when it was made. Um, for a number of reasons mm -hmm. uh we had already recorded josh keaton as spider-man it, it was excellent um i've told people that i got like goosebumps up my spine three different times when i was recruiting or it's mightiest heroes mm -hmm. the first time was when we got the full main cast together in the booth mm -hmm. for the first time and you could hear all of the avengers talking to each other Mm -hmm. um and the second time was when we brought josh keaton in to do spider-man playing off of captain america um and then the uh, third time was when we did new avengers and we had all those characters interacting with each other uh, so he was there too for that yeah uh, God, and he was great i mean his performances were really excellent and it was crushing to lose them um mm. and no slight to drake bell who did us a huge favor by coming in and recording mm. those episodes i know fans when they found out about this were giving drake a bunch of grief and it really was not drake's fault at all he no. he worked hard and he gave us a great performance and he did it in spite of the fact that i probably was just not happy to be there recording with him the entire time <laughs> um yeah that release release the josh keaton cut is what i will i'm gonna hashtag that now because <laughs> I mean, the, the audio lines probably don't exist anymore but my gosh that that is awesome because i just finished spectacular spider-man and i i can't get over how good that show is um i think i well i know you had mentioned before you had briefly 
done some work on it in terms of being over at the Marvel Studios, like discussing with Sony in terms of, you know, Greg Wiseman and all that. Uh, what was your contribution to that? Because I think you have an executive producer credit, I think, on this yep, series. I'm an associate producer on Associate. Spectre. Okay. Yeah. Because, yeah, because there's all these different producer credits. I'm like, it's hard to keep up with it. <laughs> and they're, what do they actually mean? Who knows, really? Yeah, like, exactly. Sort yeah. of like a, an honor rank thing. And I was <laughs> at the time low man on the total poll. So I get associate producer, which is still a pretty good credit. But um, hey, your name's on it, right? So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I feel really privileged to be associated with that show because I didn't have that much to do with it. And fans love it. And it's a huge credit to greg weissman and vic cook for creating it um mm -hmm. like i can list my contributions to the show in, in like i think there are 10 maybe maybe 10 items that i contributed uh <laughs> which i couldn't i i would not be able to do this for any other show that i worked on because you get so enmeshed in the story crafting process but like with spectacular spider-man i'm like well no i suggest doing this thing this thing this thing and this thing and that's what i did um yeah so for spec spidey um the title uh they originally wanted to go with uh, amazing spider-man i know greg was intent on being as classic as possible and he wanted to do amazing spider-man and amazing spider-man ended up being off the table for some reason i don't even remember whether it was a legal thing or or what um so they were looking for a different name and i suggested spectacular spider-man because i was always really partial to spectacular spider-man for the alliteration and i just I think spectacular is a better adjective to describe Spider-Man than amazing is personally. Well, I mean, amazing has been used so much, but yeah. that's interesting how it wasn't being allowed to like, maybe because the fact that they were going to do an amazing Spider-Man reboot, I doubt that was the case because they probably didn't have the title for Andrew Garfield's first film, I think in 2012. So no, but okay. Yeah. The spectacular, like, it's a, it's a more unique word and he is spectacular. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's really cool. You suggested that. That's awesome. I suggested it, like it's not a huge leap. There's a finite number of comic book titles for Spider-Man, so somebody was probably going to come up with spectacular Spider-Man, whether I was yeah. there or not. But I happened to be the person that suggested it first. <laughs> um, uh, probably my biggest contribution to the series, and I don't even know if Greg or Vic know that it was me that was responsible for this, was that um, uh, they were originally intending to use the organic web shooters from the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies. Yeah. And I hate those. I I have just like a personal pet peeve. I, I loathe them. They creep me out. I just don't like the idea of them. I think they are contrary to Spider-Man as a character. And I, I made a huge campaign to bring back the mechanical web shooters. Um, I wrote like a six point essay on all the reasons why the mechanical web shooters are better than the organic ones. And uh, my boss at the time, Craig Kyle, when I first was lobbying, he was not convinced. And then he read my like short essay on the subject. He's like, actually, you've got a lot of good points. I'm going to, he passed it on to Kevin Feige, who was kind of overseeing animation at the time. Nice. Kevin read it. Kevin agreed. He's like, yeah, do the mechanical web shooters for sure. Uh, that essay got like passed on to Tom Cohen, who is overseeing uh, our licensed live action movies like the Fox and, and Sony movies. So they went into production on um, on the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man movie shortly thereafter. And they were looking for any way to make those movies different than the Tobey Maguire ones. And he suggested based on my essay, like doing the mechanical web shooters, they're like, yeah, we're <laughs> definitely going to do that. So like, I feel a little bit responsible for the fact that the mechanical web shooters again, supplanted the organic web shooters across all media. Um, That's we brought them big, we brought them back in the comics too. Like they transitioned back from, uh, from the organic ones. And um, yeah, it's something that probably would have happened anyway, eventually without me, but um I don't know. I, I, your push changed it. Yes. I mean, uh, and I'm, I don't, I don't know. Cause I haven't seen your six point essay. I would love to read that, but <laughs> I'm, assuming, I'm, get out of my email. <laughs> I'm assuming one of the, one of the reasons you probably put down is the fact that it raises the stakes because he doesn't have in this amount of web. He, yes. at some point he's going to run out of cartridges. And then also too, when Kevin Feige got the joint deal with Sony for Tom Holland, Spider-Man, not organic. 
they went with you know cartridge it's like they probably you're probably thinking yeah that, that josh guy he uh he suggested let's <laughs> keep that we're, we're gonna we're gonna reboot spider-man again let's keep that uh, I, I feel like it also distinguishes spider-man from any other hero at marvel mm -hmm. because when they're organic he starts to like skew very close to a mutant in terms of just having all of his powers be powers yeah um i was and, just i was just thinking that mutant yeah it's a good point the mechanical nature of them highlights his genius and they it just it's it's a very unique weapon because it's not just a weapon it's a tool it's something that he can use in a variety of different ways um and with all of the different functionality that it can do between like web balls and and um creating spider webs and you yeah. know parachutes and whatnot it makes more sense for it to be mechanically based i think than than not to say nothing of the fact that you know if it was actually derived from the spider bed i think bendis made a joke about this in i in ultimate spider-man it's a good thing that that wasn't one of his natural powers because there's no telling where that web would be coming out of yeah. <laughs> but like, you, you've seen spider-man no way home i'm assuming have you seen the film? i haven't seen it yet believe it or not oh okay okay because there's something that was actually mentioned about that but i won't bring it up but you should see the movie i think you should mm. um so i'm assuming you know what's in it maybe i mean it's obvious at this point everyone's talked about it in terms of what goes on but uh what was your other contribution for spread hacker spider-man because i mean I, I know you mentioned before the um the cartridges like he has to actually make the webbing um like were, were you involved in terms of like them trying to fit because i mean you, you were there but for the title mm -hmm. organic or not was there any like more discussion about villains or like the world they were trying to build was there other particular things that you were hands-on in in terms of helping them build there were some minor things um, in early meetings. Greg was trying to figure out how to um, visually conceive Electro because he kind of wanted to do a classic Electro look, but Electro's classic mask is so goofy looking. It's one of it's one of like the least realistic, most goofy costumes in comics with the lightning bolts, like the five point lightning bolt star mask thing. Um, and I suggested that if Electro was kind of like streaming electricity off of him constantly, then some of the electricity arcing off of his head maybe could emulate that five point classic mask look. And everybody was like, they really liked that. That was, the, I think, the very first suggestion that I ever made in a meeting. I mostly kept my mouth shut when, when, the big guns were meeting but i suggested that everybody really liked it so they went with it that's a good suggestion because the way they went about with electro was really interesting and that i mean that makes sense because literally once he takes that helmet off of that like containment suit it's shooting all over the place but i mean that's a good point to bring that in to kind of show it but not to the point where he takes it off and just the electricity are just doing the stars because that would be weird because he's, yep. he's he's constantly just creating electricity. Why why would it just be a star? Yep. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, um, my gosh. And then uh, for black suit Spidey, they were trying to decide whether to just use a white version of his regular Spider-Man emblem or to give him like the full Venom emblem. And uh, I suggested having the one evolve into the other over time so that that symbol actually changes and you see it like uh i think it appears in three episodes and each episode it kind of it starts to spread out until it envelops his his body and becomes like the full venom emblem which is cool because it mirrors the idea of the symbiote taking over peter's yeah. personality and starting to control him more i will say this that is amazing that you suggested that because ah, the word amazing uh the fact to everybody in my comments when i was reacting to those episodes saying did you see did you see chainsaw the change in the emblem did you see it yeah. and i'm like guys i see it i see it happening it's really cool and that's awesome he said and also too the lines on his suit was also disappearing over time as it mm -hmm. was morphing the venom that's awesome like I that is cool. <laughs> greg weissman and i are similar in our storytelling sensibilities in some ways and that we really like to see 
slow progressions for characters over time and subtle changes in their looks and designs and personalities. Um, we like to, to draw it out as much as possible. Um, so I think that was an easy suggestion. Everybody kind of jumped at that one. I mean, also, I too, Peter didn't – his personality didn't change a lot, you know, right away. Like, it was a gradual change along with the suit. I mean, he went from – just being Peter, he's like, well, hey, well, you know, I got this new suit, you know, and then all of a sudden he's like being more aggressive when he's thinking and you can hear it like, okay, he's getting more angry. And then now he's like, I don't, I don't need them. You know, I got myself. It's like, oh, no, it's, it's us. He's talking in these course, he's referencing him and the symbiote. Um, did you like the fact that they went the direction of like the origin of uncle Ben kind of like in the Tobey Maguire esque and then the whole venom symbiote in the bell tower and all that? Did you, like that or was that something you thought maybe they could have done differently i really liked that actually um the thing about spider-man's origin story is that it has been told so many times at this point mm -hmm. that i think we all agreed very early on that we didn't want the pilot episode to be his origin again uh, just because people have seen it and it's kind of like a flat-footed way to start the series with a story that everybody already knows mm -hmm. um but i think as as a creator of a series and i'm probably putting words in greg's mouth if you're trying to tell the seminal spider-man series you kind of want to get his origin in there somewhere and i thought doing it in the way that they did it with this stylized um subconscious flashback while while he was being possessed by venom was a really clever way to do it that not only uh tells the story and gets it into the series but does it in in an, a heightened emotional way where uncle you see uncle ben's influence be directly relevant to what peter is going through i mean yeah and it really was impactful for him to realize how much he has in terms of friends and family and I mean, in, in the stylizing of it too with the black and white it was so cool because they could have just shown like you said the first episode here's the origin and then we'll jump ahead in time but yet they actually wait like they don't tell you like he's still learning obviously like he's he's spider-man he's doing you know being amazing spectacular but he's not like just started out yesterday he's been doing this for a bit but what i liked is that the show also integrated the villains to where he hasn't faced them before. You know, he's not new, but, you know, not a veteran where he's faced all these people before. Like, they found a way to kind of balance it to where he's still learning, he's making mistakes, but, you know, he's been, ar he's been around for a little bit, so he knows what's going on. Yeah, he's uh, been dealing with, you know, crooks and, and yeah. low-tier street crime, but not so much supervillains yet. Yeah, the, now, okay, I, ha I do have a question, because I think this was brought up by some viewers of mine the big man on the phone yes was that actually going to be kingpin or was because i think that was originally going to be kingpin and then they had to change it because of character rights is that correct that is yeah uh tombstone's character was originally going to be kingpin in the series okay um and the entire all all, all of basically tombstone's entire role in the series was meant to be occupied by kingpin but due to legal complications with the Fox Daredevil deal. Kingpin was off limits. And uh, that was that was a tough one because, you know, creatively, obviously, Kingpin would have been the optimal fit for it. But um, uh, my boss, Craig Kyle, came up with the suggestion of using Tombstone, I think, and threw that out there for them. And I think they did a great job bringing that character to life and, and making him different than Kingpin would be so it feels like more of a unique fit for the series uh i think greg tried to keep some sense alive that there might be somebody even above tombstone who could ultimately be kingpin so that if kingpin's rights ever freed up for them that they would able to be able to bring him in too but i think it was fairly apparent because you only hear his voice in the first episode mm -hmm. and it's the big man okay who's the big man they did the same thing with the hawkeye series in terms of referencing oh there's a big man who's the big man i think we know who the big man is but it was a nice touch because tombstone 
for the most part, isn't really like he isn't really like well known mm-hmm. in the public eye. So the idea of them using him as like a main force and the fact that he had a lot of screen time, like he had a lot to do with the show was really bonkers. Um, I want to transition to Avengers real quick because I actually forgot yeah. to mention something. I'm thinking in my head, I like, can't forget this. I spoke to your Iron Man, Eric Loomis. I Eric spoke to Loomis, him. yeah. I spoke to him for an hour on the phone. And when he answered the call, he said, Jordan. I'm like, <laughs> Iron Man's talking to me. And it was so cool to talk to him because he was talking about the process of working on the show. And you had mentioned too, bringing the whole cast in. I know nowadays, in terms of recording, for shows or whatever it is that they just bring in people when they can and they'll just splice it all together. But back then I think it it was important to have everybody in the room. And he said he really appreciated that because it just worked better off the lines. Yeah. It's, it's not always, even, even before the pandemic, it's not always the way that animation worked. Uh, It just kind of depends project to project, but for our TV stuff, as much as possible, we tried to get all the main cast in at the same time because their performances are just better when they can play off of each other uh, in real time. Um, It's more fun for everybody too, frankly. Uh, You get to know the other cast members and, um, you know, you get to experiment a little bit more with the scenes too because you can push both of them simultaneously in one direction or, or, or another. Yeah, because the lines, because, you know, an, a, a well-trained actor or somebody who just knows how to read a, a certain line and they can read a few different ways, like the words can be read differently. And when you're in the room and you're like, okay, so we could play it this way, but maybe it's working better like this. And I think that's really, really cool that you guys are able to do that because maybe this series would have been different or maybe the scenes would not have worked as well, maybe because not everybody's in the same room. Uh, but he he loved working on the show. He was talking high praise about it. And I said, if the show was to come back, would you do? He's like, I would take, I would do it. No problem. I would take half pay to do it. I'm like, that's awesome. <laughs> really noted. No, uh, <laughs> he was great to work with. Uh, just such a joy. Always. So ent- he was, he was like, I, I think of all of our cast members, probably the biggest fan of the show itself. And he was so excited to see what was going to happen every week, which is great to have that in your cast. Because some of the, you know, most of our voice actors come in and they're very professional and they're great at what they do. But a lot of them work on tons of shows at the same time. And, you know, how can you focus on what's happening in, in one series? Um, I mean, it, it's it's else. definitely it's definitely difficult because, you know, a lot of times they, they're going to multiple studios in a week to work on projects. But I mean, it's really cool to hear his passion for it because he really loves playing the character and he was ecstatic to get the show because I mean, in a sense, he does sound like Robert Downey Jr. A little bit with his natural voice, which is so crazy because when he first gets film, like that's Iron Man, it's, 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 it's Eric, but it's Iron Man. Uh, like, were you there for the casting process or were you just there for the production side of it for? No, I was heavily involved in casting. Uh, yeah, it's funny because a lot of people originally when the show first came out thought that this was somebody doing their best Robert Downey Jr. impression. And what they didn't realize is it's just his natural speaking voice when you talk to yeah. him. That's that's him. He's just yeah. a great fit for the character. Um, uh, yeah, Jamie Simone, who was our voice director, uh, and I were the main people making casting decisions uh, for the most part. Early on for the very main cast, I had to run it up the ladder of corporate to get sign off from the very higher ups on voices for Iron Man and Thor and Captain America. Um, But at that point, we had narrowed the options down from, I think, you know, hundreds of submissions to two or three choices that we liked the best. Uh, And then once the show got up and running, it was pretty much jamie would narrow down the selection to 10 to 20 voices and i would go through and figure out who would be the best fit um that, that's very it's very like i would say probably time consuming because you have to think about everything like is this person delivering enough emotion or can this person deliver anger because 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 w- when you're writing the show you have a huge variety of characters like vendors or the x-men there's so many different characters 
eventually characters are going to go in one direction. They're going to go this way. They're going to have to find that tone that works because you don't want someone to go over the top of something and make it ridiculous. It's got to feel real. Yeah, Chris was very good at putting together sides for us for the auditions to read to that encompassed not only, you know, what the character was going to be like in the first episode that they appeared in, but the entire arc that they were going to go through potentially for the entire series. Wow. Um, so, you know, if a character had a dark turn like Ant-Man, for instance, we would be starting him in one place in the sides and then transitioning to his more yellow jacket personality by the end. <laughs> that, that, um, that's so crazy. I couldn't believe that happened to poor Ant-Man. Like, poor guy. You know, everything just fell apart for him. Poor and then we did callbacks for most of these roles, too, where we would get our top two or three people in the booth and we would get a chance to work with them a little bit to see how they took direction and, and what else they could do or to tweak the performance a little bit to get it right into the right space, which mm -hmm. is always good. Um, a lot of the choices were hard, though. Uh, but, you know, I'm pretty I'm pretty proud of the cast that we were able to put together for as many heroes. Oh, I am as well, because every time I think back on this show, I just hear their voices. And I feel like, oh, no, no, that's Iron Man. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming that was probably the most difficult choice, probably besides Captain America. It's probably Iron Man. Because, I mean, I mean, even like he's essentially, like, you know, Cap and Iron Man, they're kind of like running the show, even though he you know, mm -hmm. owns a mansion or whatever. But he looks to Cap for guidance. So I would assume those are probably the two most important voices to get down, because it hinges on them. Cause I asked Eric, like, how was it to kind of have it on your shoulders to kind of, you're, you're kind of the guy running it all. And he's like, a lot of pressure. I'm like, but it's like, it pressure, but I mean, you nailed it. You know, he, I mentioned to him, my, one of my favorite episodes was the whole idea of vision waking up and seeing the world encased in armor, essentially the whole idea of him becoming a dictator, of course, the purple man's behind it. I'm like, I, I like to see that because it's what Tony could have done if he didn't have any restraints, but obviously it went too far, but like, that's Tony, what he would have wanted to do, but he would have went, Hmm, it's my backfire. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is I'm actually playing guardians of the galaxy, the new game that came out last year. Um, you guys, of course, brought in guardians. Was there any mm -hmm. chance to bring them back? Yes. Okay. Um, we, for a long time, had been planning to potentially bring them back in the season finale of uh, the second season. Mm. The second season of Earth's Mightiest Heroes was supposed to end very differently than it did uh, originally, and our, our plans got kind of diverted um, with a new creative direction halfway through the season. Mm. Um, but originally, the Avengers, uh, it was going to be a multi-part finale and Galactus was going to be attacking Hela while the Avengers were still on Hela um, with the Supreme Intelligence. Ooh. And they were going to be put in a situation where the Supreme Intelligence calculated that there was no way to defeat Galactus and basically abandoned the people on Hela, the Kree people on Hela to Galactus's whim. And it was up to the Avengers to actually save the Kree from Galactus, in spite of the fact that the Kree had just attempted to destroy the Earth yeah. uh, and them and had been experimenting on them. And Chris and I thought it was important to show a different kind of heroism from the Avengers for the second season finale, that this wasn't just about protecting themselves or protecting their own people, but to expand what it meant to be a hero and yeah. that meant standing up for people, even your enemies who can't stand up for themselves necessarily in a situation. That, uh, that would have been awesome. That'd have been great. Um, Cause I know you had mentioned that by the time you got to the season two finale, which now makes sense because you had different plans that you already knew this was the end. So you had to wrap it up where Galactus shows up on earth and, uh, and I still think back on the conversation about why Galactus didn't speak and the fact that he sees them as nothing. Like, why would he speak? Like, why? what gain would he get for speaking to the Avengers? Because to him, yep. they're just, you know, little ants. They're nothing. He doesn't care. He's here to feed the world. worthy of their, his notice. <sighs> yeah. 
so the the guardians potentially could have been in that episode uh the avengers might have called them for help uh, chris and i had talked potentially about the fact that it might have been the guardians that rescued black panther uh at the end of um uh which episode was that operation galactic storm yeah I th- yeah because he he sacrificed he was he was going to sacrifice himself so that they can get through the portal um that would have been really cool. That would have been a cool reveal for them to go, oh, by the way, hello, we're here. It was so cool to see them show up. Because at first I'm like, who are these people? Oh, it's the Guardians. Oh, okay. I mean, come on. Like, they're they're a wacky group of characters. I mean, you got to bring them back, I would think. Uh, I don't know if we discussed this before. Was there ever a discussion about Thanos? Uh, there was a very early discussion about Thanos. And... So this was long before anybody knew that he was going to be involved in any of the live action stuff. Uh, I don't, the people working on the movies didn't even know that he was going to be part of Avengers at that point. This was all pre Avengers film. Um, but I early on wanted to stay away from Thanos. And the reason is kind of funny, but the, other show at marvel that was being produced at the same time was superhero squad and thanos was the main villain of that show and that entire show was based around first the infinity sword and then the infinity gauntlet and um like pretty much the whole thrust of that that show's villain stuff is is thanos and i just said let's leave that for them and cover everything else and somewhere down the line maybe once they're past the thanos stuff we could get into it um in in light of the fact that the mcu dealt heavily into thanos i'm actually glad that we stayed away from thanos uh because i feel like it would have been overkill for people to see thanos over and over again but uh, my my early inclination was probably we would get to some infinity stuff by like season five if we ever got that far. So are you here to announce we're getting season three through five? <laughs> I, I like I wouldn't have complained. Obviously, I wasn't watching the show live back then, but if the show would have kept going and we got to Thanos, yes, I would love it because I love the, the interpretation of what you did with the show. I'm down for anything. I was down for Christopher's joke tweets about X Men versus Avengers, Dark Phoenix. Bring it on. Yeah do it come on i mean i'm always planning very far in a, ahead so like magic and mutants for season three season four was gonna probably get into some civil war registration stuff hero versus hero um, we should kind of get into that a little bit like yeah um, yeah we, we were setting it up for sure uh and then i was kind of thinking like season five we might get back to more cosmic infinity type things Oh gosh, that's so cool. Uh, well, see, last year we had Eternals that came out. Now I know for a long time Eternals was kind of like not really seen in the comics too much. Was there any idea or talks of Eternals coming into? I mean, I, that's like that's really far out there. But I mean, you brought in Guardians, so I mean, yeah, it's we there. never talked about the Eternals, uh, partly because I was never sure how to do them, really well it's a it's a hard concept to crack and and to incorporate into the larger marvel universe in my estimation um yeah it never it was never really on we had so much other stuff to to cover that was really in close proximity to the avengers that we never there were some things that we didn't talk about (laughs) oh and that's understandable because there's literally and I think you had mentioned this in our second discussion about Wolverine and the X-Men, that if the mutant side of the Marvel Universe broke off into its own thing, it would be the second largest group of characters in terms of how many characters are involved in mutants. So it makes sense that with that fact alone, there's so many Marvel characters, heroes and villains and anti-heroes and all that kind of stuff, that it would take a long time probably to get to Eternals because there's so many other characters you could get to. I mean, because you started introducing... Uh, Wolverine and then kind of hinting the X-Men and, and then I mean in season one you had 
it's clobbering time. Like, I don't know where the Fantastic Four are starting to show up. Like, what is going on with this show? Like, the <laughs> guys are setting up stuff, and it's so crazy. And then the season two premiere, they're showing up for card games. Okay, whatever. Um, and I, I, my mind's all over the place. I'm trying to think of everything. I, I like the fact earlier you mentioned how you and Greg Wiseman like to stretch stories out and just kind of keep it in suspense. So he did with Cap when it was fake Cap. That's what you did. You kept, like... He's finding out, like, oh, by the way, guys, you forgot? Okay, here's another hint. It's not Cap, in case you forgot. <sighs> Gosh, I, I miss watching that show. <laughs> I miss watching that show. Gosh, such a good uh, such a good series. And then, of course, now with Gamma Core, I'm like, oh, that would have been awesome, too. Uh, was there any other shows that was pitched that never went past a certain point? Yeah. Uh, I have also said before that people would be appalled if they knew how many things I pitched or had done a little bit of development on at some point and just never saw the light of day. Mm -hmm. um, there was an Iron Man series that I pitched. There was a Thor series that uh, I did some development on with um greg johnson who was the head writer of wolverine and the x-men and um, a lot of the lionsgate movies <clears throat> um there let's see what else i mean there were there were other shows that i was perpetually throwing out there as my top candidates of shows to do like i really wanted to do a, a captain america and bucky world war ii series yeah. um, okay which just would never have been green light at Marvel, but it was always one of my top candidates. Um, some of it in Avengers. I mean, you did have some adventure uh, adventures with them, and yes, we 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 got to show some of it, and then and rush Kang, against it a little bit. And then Kang watching them at a point because mm -hmm. he's trying to figure out what happened to my timeline and that whole mess. I mean, it, that the whole Kang stuff was awesome too. I mean, that this so many things you guys covered so many things in two seasons. I don't know how you pulled it off. You covered so much, and yet there's still so much more that you guys could have got into. I mean, the fact that you probably could have got to Thanos in season five, and oh my gosh, that'd have been freaking crazy. I know we had talked to about Onslaught, which I think you probably was like that would never have been covered. <laughs> I don't know how you because I I got the omnibus, um, and I forgot how big that omnibus is, and that thing is a massive book. I don't know how you would have covered a version of that story because it probably would have taken you two seasons maybe if you <laughs> wanted to really cover it properly because there's so much we we're pretty good at condensing things so we probably could have done it in in the space of one season but there's just a lot of setup that you have to mm -hmm. do to be able to tell that story and then having to pull off the ultimate fight between hulk and a in in onslaught for like two episodes or something just constant <laughs> brawling and people go okay will it end no we're still going no, Unslot will never stop. So Hulk has to give give it all. And then also, too, I think your show would be over unless you would time travel because he kills pretty much almost everyone, essentially. There's so many people that die from that series. Like your show would have to end. And that would end on a bad note. So I would say, no, let's not do Unslot. Even though it would have been awesome. It would have been cool. Uh, I'm just trying to think. I, I There's just so many things... That you've worked on it's it's crazy the amount of stuff you did and uh, when did you leave marvel when did you leave uh 2011 spring 2011 man it's been that long it's crazy yeah it's crazy um oh something i did want to ask because uh, you're obviously a big fan of marvel uh were you a big dc guy as well in terms of dc comics or not as much as um, I love Batman. Uh, Batman, the animated series, was also a huge influence on me as a kid. Uh, and I owned a ton of Batman comics. Um, less familiar with the larger DC universe um, and mostly exposed to it through animation. Uh, Justice League and Superman and whatnot. Was... Um... If you had an opportunity, would you do a Batman show? Is that what you would try if you were given the opportunity? Because, I mean, there's been so many Batman shows. I'm currently watching the 2004 animated Batman show called The Batman, which is pretty crazy. But mm. uh, it, would that would that be your pitch, or would you try to do a Justice League team-up show? Interesting. Um, 
you know, actually my favorite DC character is probably Robin, which is, I don't think that's very common. I don't think that's an opinion held by a lot of people, but I have always loved which Robin. Robin. Which Robin? Uh, I, I like the original personally, um, although all three of them, or I guess there's more than three of them now, all of them are pretty interesting in different ways. Um, okay. So Dick Grayson. But Dick he... Grayson, I, I, again, he was the first one that I knew, so I, I tend to gravitate towards him. Um, but I was always fascinated by the idea of a fairly normal kid trying to exist in Batman's universe and getting this crazy training and being thrown into these situations that, I mean, when you think about the stuff that Batman does, it's really insane. Um, yes. And the situations that he voluntarily places himself in are insane. And you think about a kid or even a teenager be putting, being put in those situations and and what that must do to a person. Um, I don't know. I think there's a lot there that could be pretty interesting for a series. But <laughs> That's a good point. Nice. That's a good point because he's just like, he goes through a, tra a tragedy similar to Bruce, and then he's like, all right, I guess I'll fight crime now. Like, but he's having fun with it. You know, he's like, ah, this is great. Like, you know, we're, we're, having, we're playing pretend. No, Penguin's shooting at you. No, this is not good. That's pretty interesting, though. A Rob, it'd be, it'd be like a Robin show from his perspective. Because mm -hmm. with Batman, like the animated series, when he brought Robin in, it's from Bruce's perspective in terms of the story. But with Robin, they called Robin or the Boy Wonder, probably just Robin, but the Boy Wonder. But for him to see through his perspective, so maybe classic Batman stories being told in animation or just how he like what is his experience like how does he view them like him and Batman going to a warehouse somewhere to fight the Penguin or Two Face like what's his perspective like what is he thinking that'd be interesting. By the uh, way, he's he's wearing red and yellow while Batman's in black. Like <laughs> how is that fair? And, and over time, oh, um, come Nightwing, I think I'm going to change it up to black and blue. <laughs> so it's not terrible. Yeah, because that's that's a good point. Like, he definitely stands out against what Batman wears. Because, I mean, even though Adam West, he had the purple and everything, but mm -hmm. traditional Batman, it's gray or black. There's like, the yellow emblem, okay, maybe. But other cases, it's just it's like a gray emblem or whatever, or a different color off the chest. So... That works, but that'd be interesting. That'd be pretty cool. I mean, they have that Harley Quinn animated show that's like crazy. Like that's like her perspective on all this nonsense. But then again, it's an over the top crazy show. So, but I mean, I think that'd be kind of cool if you could do that. I mean, um, are you are you working on anything right now, or are you just kind of uh, chilling? Nothing exciting, unfortunately. Um, so if if anybody at DC wants to give me a call to do a Robin series, <laughs> you let me know. And, um, and yeah, I've been think, developing some of my own stuff with, you know, fingers <laughs> crossed that it might see the light of day someday, but not no work for hire on anything at the moment. Gotcha. I mean, you know, hey, look, it's things happen. I mean, I, I went from just being a silly little YouTuber and all of a sudden I get an email from this guy, Josh, going, hey, I've seen your. <laughs> oh, let's chat. And now I know you through this and it's been awesome, you know, to kind of chat with you to kind of learn your perspective on stuff. I mean, you were part of some of the best Marvel animated shows that I've ever seen. I mean, I know there's a lot of Marvel animation out there, but I mean, in terms of what people talk about, I mean, yeah, you didn't do a lot on Spectacular Spider-Man, but the things you pointed out that you suggested, I mean, that's important stuff for that show. And the fact that you were there from beginning to end for Avengers, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, Wolverine and the X-Men, you were there throughout the whole thing and then helping pitch story towards the end. I mean, that's, that's a big accomplishment. You know? It was a, it, it was like a real era at, and you can almost define it. I mean, there were transition periods, but mm -hmm. it, it was a pretty distinct era at Marvel Animation, um, and it was a small, pretty close knit group of people working on this stuff for the most part. Um, it, I would say, it probably started during X Men Evolution, which predated me. I was still in college, I think, when that show was on the air. Um, but Craig Kyle joined their team during the second season of X-Men Evolution. Um, and Greg Johnson was the head writer on that. And together they 
that show turned out to be great. I think it got a lot of flack early on for not being the X-Men 90s series, but it eventually found its audience. Uh, and then, you know, like straight out of school, I got a chance to work on Fantastic Four World's Greatest Heroes. Um, and then we did Wolverine and the X-Men and the Iron Man Armored Adventures and all the the eight Lionsgate films. Um, I The first four of them were kind of already underway by the time I got there. Um, but I started to be able to contribute when it came to like Next Avengers and Thor Tales of Asgard, Hulk versus That's Planet cool. Hulk, of course. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because those, those animated films are pretty cool. You know, and also, too, it's like Marvel's starting to pick up now on animation because it sounds like they're opening studios again in terms of trying to get animation being brought back. Um, I'm assuming if they called you, you'd probably jump back in. I mean, I don't know. I guess it depends on what kind of projects. But I mean, if they were to call you up and say, hey, we're because I think there was like something about where Marvel, since Kevin Feige is now running everything on that side of the division of the movies and animation, all that kind of stuff, it sounds like they're starting to be announcing more animation products so they got what spider-man like first year or something like at origin and then they got uh the what if series going on now and i x-men 97 i mean would you jump back in if they called you and said would you want to come back and work on marvel um it would depend on the project uh, but i'm certainly open to it um if we were talking about reviving one of the series that i worked on i would definitely be open to it uh you know, other than that, like it, it comes down to me mostly in having the right amount of creative freedom to tell good stories. Okay. Uh, having having been through the process of having you know my shows messed with at various <laughs> times, like I just want to know if I'm going to commit to the amount of work that producing one of those series takes or writing one of those series takes that. I will be able to see it through to the end in the way that I want it to happen. Uh, That's a good point. Cause I mean, the studio system in general, I mean, you, you're told one thing and then something else happens like to where, you know, it, it compromise, I think, but I also too, like it's got to really come down to compromise. If you're told you can't do something, well then find a happy medium for something. Cause uh, when you told me that the way you killed off, um, uh, Emma Frost and Wolverine and the X-Men and the way it was shown, I'm like, so that was just like first draft. It didn't have to change. No, I'm like, that's shocking. Cause that's brutal. But I mean, I, I guess it just depends on the subject and the character. I would assume is probably what causes those changes. Yeah. And I generally speaking, like I don't mind having constraints if I know what they are up front because you can work around them from the, very inception of the show you can figure out um you can figure out creative solutions to the challenges that you have to navigate the the part that i don't like so much is having constraints added very late in the game <laughs> that kind of derails everything that you've been setting up and that that is a headache is it more of like character restraint or subject matter or like how how you're going to tell your story is it can be all of the above um yeah i mean it 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 varies sometimes you end up with standards and practice issues with your broadcaster where you have to go back and figure out how you're going to scale back the violence or something mm -hmm. um sometimes you're told late in the game that you're actually not allowed to use a character anymore uh sometimes you're the told that you can't do continuity in your episodes anymore. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, that'd be brutal. Especially how you've been, how you told your stories. I mean, what do you mean you can't have continuity? Or, that or was, Believe it or not, that was the argument that I had most often in my years at Marvel. Like almost like clockwork every six months or so, somebody would bring up the fact bring up the question of whether we should have as much serialization in our tv series as we did and whether all of our shows shouldn't just be one and dones and you know i would win that argument like once every six months for seven years and then 
you lose that argument one time <laughs> and it's lost forever is probably is really the issue and that's kind of kind of what happened but i feel like a lot of people agree that like continuity serialization like the idea of keeping up with the story is more entertaining and it's more interesting than just doing a one and done one and done because eventually like okay where's the character growth where's okay so that thing happened to that character okay why is it being addressed later like well because there's no eh, you know whatever it's not important it is important because i feel like if avengers earth minus heroes was not a serialized following the storyline and it's it's deep storytelling if it was just a one and done villain of the week i probably wouldn't appreciate it because it it would just be okay well okay we're fighting the red skull this week okay okay now we're gonna go fight this villain it's gonna lose its interest for me because i'm like i yeah. like the fact that we got to see the progression of the avengers over time because the team was never always the same there was always something going on with the character always something going on with the team and the fact that i mean literally just one reference the ultron bot that was heavily set up for multiple episodes if that wasn't a thing and all of a sudden ultron just shows up well where's the build up ah, mm -hmm. doesn't matter I mean, from a fundamental standpoint, storytelling is all about character, and you really can't tell these kinds of, of stories without character growth and development, like you said. And for that to happen, there has to be some amount of serialization, um, even if it's happening in mostly self-contained stories to still see character progression and relationship progression over time is really important. Um, with Avengers specifically, you also can't have the kinds of stakes that are necessary to tell those stories well, unless the audience believes that you're telling it in a world that can actually change. Like, there has to be some possibility that the heroes could lose and that there could be ramifications for that. Um, and, you know, when, when we start the series by having characters leave the team almost immediately, you kind of set the stage for the fact that anything can happen in this show. I mean, the whole fact of the scroll storyline and the fake cap telling the world to embrace change and how that greatly affected the series. If it was not no, no continuity, eh, doesn't matter what fake cap said. It's not going to affect cap in real life. It's not going to affect him being a hero. It, it really just, it makes everything better. As, and coming full circle to what we talked at the very beginning uh, of, of this conversation, it's easier than ever for people to find all of the episodes of something now. Like oh. when, when we were kids, if you missed a week, then you just didn't know what happened other than the recap at the beginning of the episode. Um, and That's nowadays between... You know? streaming and on demand and downloadable options and dvds although nobody uses those anymore i guess <laughs> uh you know and you know youtube and and everything else there's just so many ways to view these series and to see all of the series in one convenient place that the drawbacks of what used to be the drawbacks of serialization really don't exist anymore. Like the, the worry used to be that, well, if people miss an episode and they don't know what's going on, they're not going to want to watch the next one. And yeah, that might be true to some extent. Um, but there's, there's the flip side argument, which is that if they know that they have to watch every episode to keep up with it, then they're going to want to watch them a lot more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in today's climate, you only have the upside and none of the downside. So why not do it? I mean, yeah, it's, it's true because with those recaps, as you were mentioning, they don't show you a lot. They just show you the big moments. And I noticed that too when I'm watching like some on Netflix or whatever. It's like previously on. And it's like they don't do that anymore like in current shows, but like previously on. And they'll show like stuff. I'm like, oh, they didn't show this, this, and this, which is also important. But it didn't matter because they got time constraints. It's like... It's irritating, but I mean, thankfully, like you said, everything in terms of what you worked on is readily available on Disney Plus. They can watch from beginning to end. I mean, even though I think they have it kind of flipped to where um, the episode where they all come together is the first episode, then they backtrack. That's frustrating, but thankfully, I was told ahead of time, do not watch that first because that is after the setup. 
because I'm like, okay, thank you. Because I want to see the origin or the setup of Iron Man, then Hulk and all that, then the team up, and then we'll go to the next thing. So that was that was good because I don't know why they did that, but I guess it's just because oh, like, we're gonna show them all teamed up, then we'll set up set them all up. Like, no, that's how they released it. Put it out this way. I think by default they just uploaded them in in broadcast order. And because yeah. we had aired the micro series in pieces on YouTube and other other online uh, streaming platforms, yeah. um, the first episodes to actually be broadcast on Disney XD were Breakout Part One and Two. Okay. And then they that that's why that happened, I think. But uh, they just pulled them and went all right, and just put them on like that. I mean, that's frustrating, but I mean. I mean, it, I, if people watch it that way, it's not the end of the world, but I think it's better to watch it as here's the setup for each character and then here's Breakout, and then you can continue. I feel like that's the better approach, but that's just me. That's how I watched it. <laughs> that is how it was originally intended to be consumed. Yeah, and you were explaining the whole backstory about how you had this idea and like, like can we do this? It's like, well, I, 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 let's try it. It's, it's a cool concept. I mean, I think it worked in terms of ex- exploring and kind of introducing each hero was since you were going to be following it was pretty smart and it paid off in terms of keeping up with the storylines and everything i think it just it worked for the best because if, if you just had breakout part one and two and no real build up for these characters just okay here's the avengers <sighs> okay i don't think it feels like the avengers without them existing on their own beforehand yeah. i just don't think you get the same vibe of a of a team up team yeah without it yeah well uh it was great talking to you um i think i think we need to set up like a live stream event where people can ask you questions because i feel like people would be dying to ask you questions yeah about, that'd be cool with that. yeah, that'd be awesome and uh and I, I'm, I'm praying to the marvel gods that we get the shows brought back and everything be happy hunky dory because i definitely want to you know see some of that wolverine and x-men season two avengers season three through five, six, seven, eight, whatever, you know, however long you guys planned out. Um, but yeah, it was great talking to you and I hope you're doing well. And uh, I guess we need to plan out something for live. That's what we need to Sounds do. Sounds great. Always great to talk to you, Chainsaw. Um, thank you for accepting and being here. Uh, I guess that's the end. I guess we'll just call it. Just All right. Month.